Don't Speak Podcast. We're here with Tony Momberger having so much fun. Um, we have just as much fun off uh, off camera, off site as we do on. But in any event, talk to me about what it was like growing up as a person of color in Redlands. Because I couldn't imagine that just oh. because I, I wasn't here at that time. I didn't get to Redlands until I was 17 years old. So. I have so much to say. That, that story starts with my grandparents as children, but I want to start, before I even launch into that, I want to super fast talk about peop, the the demographics of Redlands. Sure. Um, the, just zoom out and then look at the context. And the fact that we've got people right now legitimately trying to solve a legitimate problem, right. which is representation on the Redland City Council. Oh, and wow. we've got, we haven't gone to where we need to be yet, yes. but but there is some improvement, right? We have, right. We've got LGBTQIA sure. represented. We've got Latinos. I was the first Latina ever to serve on the Redland City Council. Right. Right. We've got, um, but people, people say legitimately that there is a preponderance of wealthy people and right. older people, right. which is not representative of the demographics of our community right. to have um, five seats and be struggling so hard to get to get more diversity on the council. Sure. And so what's happened is they've divided us into districts and, and that has had um, some effect. And then they right. say, um, you know, that recently... Um, was proposed to rotate the mayoral seat right. to have the the ultimate power there on the on the bench, uh, right. hit all of the districts, and I, um, I think that it's really important to to look back, zoom out, and say they get five hundred dollars a month. What are you going to get? You're right. going to get sure. retired people, and yeah. you're going to get wealthy people. Right, that's right. Somebody who has got to work more than eight hours a day right. to survive can't do, it. can't do it. That's right. And I was able to do it for the three years that I did because my husband was willing to let our savings dwindle in order to support this effort, right? right. We were able to squeak by, but it was hard and it was painful. And I could not have afforded another four-year term. Right. So I think that it's really important to look at the fact that if we truly want yes. our elected representatives to reflect the demographics of our community and the diversity right. of our community, we have got to increase the salary. If you right. look at all the other towns sure. and how much they're making, you're talking about maybe $60,000 plus a car, plus insurance, plus a stipend, right? right? You're looking oh, at yeah. money. Redlands is so far segregated right. in 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 disparity right. here for pay anyway right. i think that's the solution so let me go back to um and try to fit this in this is a big question you just asked me right. my grandfather's family is from chihuahua mexico that's mm. the tarumaran tribe of native american indians right. and i don't know when his parents came to Redlands. Mm -hmm. They were in the Bryn Mawr area. Um, in fact, there's a street named after my great grandmother. They're um, kind of celebrities of their own time. Right. They came at some point, and I, I think my cousin Leanne knows, but, um, and they might not both have been Tarumaran Indian, but at any rate, I know that that's where my Tarumaran side comes from. And they had 12 children that grew to adults. Right. Um, Interesting side story, very short. The The first child they had was a girl, and I don't know if maybe my Arafala was, was next in line, but their first son they named Daniel after my great-grandfather, and he died as an infant. So they had another boy and named him Daniel, and he died as an infant. And then finally, I don't know how many Daniel babies they went through before my Uncle Dan right. survived and grew wow. to adulthood, and then they had other boys and, and named them other names. But it was interesting to me that they would keep trying this name. They really wow. wanted a junior so bad that they just kept naming him the same name. Yeah. I thought that was weird. Um, but at any rate, so he grew up here, and uh, he went to Mission Elementary School. As a little boy, he didn't have shoes. Like, all the way through high school, he didn't have wow. shoes um, I think people just call them Mexicans, but I, I, the reason I talk about, I don't know when they came here is because I'm pretty sure they were on this land before it was, when it, when this land was Mexico. Right. right? And so right. I think it's important to make the distinction that he's a native, my grandfather right. sure. was born and raised here. He right. was, the first time he left here was to go to world, serve in world war two. Wow. So in the army air Corps. So my grandmother was one of nine children. Right. She's got a really interesting story. She was also born and raised, and um, 
but her mother was Mexican, right. also from Chihuahua. Right. Came here as a little girl when she was orphaned to live with her aunt. And I don't know when her aunt Lala, it was her mother's sister, came here. So I don't know how far back my family goes. Right. But right. but Redlands, born right. and bo- here, raised. So, so she was my great-grandmother, Concha Perez. Uh, Concepcion was her full name was married off to a boy who was Korean because her parents thought he owned a laundromat. He did not. Wow. Um, but but she was married off to him when she was a young girl, a teenager, I think. And they didn't. she didn't speak any English, and he didn't speak any English. He spoke Korean. She spoke Spanish. Wow. So my grandmother was the sixth of nine children. Mm-hmm. Strange side story. I won't go too long, but he was assassinated when my grandmother was six months old. He was part oh. of a um, an underground revolution movement in Korea. He published wow. a thing, and then his brother stepped in and and married, and then the the his widow and had three more kids. Wow. So um, there's a whole story in that, but kind of interesting. But at any rate, so my grandmother's half Korean and half Mexican. Right. Although I say she's Mexican, but she was born and raised here in California. Right. Right? Right. And my grandfather was 100% um, Latino. I'm going to say Latino because that's a word we're using now. But um, mm. at any rate, so they they grew up here. They met at the skating rink. It's now O'Reilly's, I think, Auto Parts wow. on Orange Street. It's wow. a brick building by the train station. Wow. It used to be a skating rink, and on Mexican Day – my grandparents were allowed to go there wow. and skate. And sure. that's where they met. My grandpa says he looked across the skating rink and saw this beautiful girl in a red scarf. And my grandma says, I never had a red scarf. <laughs> but at any rate. So, as long as they got together. So. so they got married. And right away, they got married in on December 5th in Redlands, 1942. It was not legal. Because my grandfather was entirely Latino and my grandmother was half Korean, um, you can't a, a Korean can't marry a white a Caucasian right. couldn't legally marry a Korean, mm. and so on December twentieth they drove to Arizona and got married again right. to make it legal. Wow. Um, so so right away there's this right you're talking about they could only go swimming at the floral plunge because right. the Sylvan plunge didn't allow sure um, well Mexicans could go swimming on the day that they cleaned it that they drained it and cleaned it right. Um, but it was very segregated. Most of the businesses in Redlands, if you were a person of color, you couldn't go in any business south of the railroad tracks. Right. But there was a German cu- couple, the Schultes, who owned the Flamingo, mm-hmm. and the Mexicans couldn't pronounce it. They called it the shoot. They called the place Schultes. Wow. They would allow you to go in there. Wow. The only barber north of the tracks was in what I call Kay's Cafe, but it was later band sport, band board shop, and I think mm-hmm. it's vacant now. Um, he was blind. <laughs> <laughs> Blind Barber, that's the only place they could go because wow. you weren't allowed to go north of the tracks at any rate. Right. So it was incredibly segregated. It was it was rough, and they were poor. Right. Both of my grandparents were poor. They right. were both native Spanish speakers, even though they were born here and they were raised here. Right. So they spoke English, but their native language, both of them, was Spanish. At right. some point, my grandfather also learned French. Right. My grandparents were smart right. people. They were right. smart, accomplished people who did not get the opportunity to go to college. Right. But by the time they died, they had so much. Um, my grandmother had, was a manager, and my grandfather was an artist. He right. was a very successful artist, even from elementary school. I have a, a photo of a painting he drew in elementary school of Mission Elementary School. Wow. I want to go back one quick second and talk about one of my grandfather's sisters, my Aunt Rafaela. My Aunt Rafaela grew up segregated the way they did the elementary schools well the way they did the schools in redlands was the mexicans had to go to one school where they weren't taught science and literature they Mm. were taught um mending clothes and um, harvesting oranges like they were taught labor right and and that's the way my grandfather and his siblings were educated right when rafaela was a mother right she She had her kids at Mission Elementary School, and she figured out how to um, pack the school board with people who would support her efforts to desegregate. She desegregated the schools in Redlands. 
And then she was called by somebody in Los Angeles, and they said, can you help us do that here? And right. she did, and then she was called in Sacramento. Right. She desegregated the school system in California. Wow. And then, Sorry. by name, she was listed as the inspiration for Brown, Brown versus the Board of Education. Wow. My Aunt Rafaela, who's my grandfather's sister, who I knew. Wow. Um, she also right. founded Saint uh, Joseph the Worker Catholic Church in Loma Linda. She, wow. She's the one who, who uh, made that church. Oh. But I didn't even know this until I was 30 years old and I wrote her obituary when I was working at the Press Enterprise. Wow. Um, anyway, incredible yeah. impact that she had sure. on the race issues right. within my community. Right. So I, I was born and raised uh, here. I was born at Redlands Community Hospital in 1969, in the summer of 1969. And um, I'm half, my father is Norwegian or Danish, there's some dispute, but at any rate, I'm half white, right? right. And I'm three quarters Latino, na uh, half Native American, and right. um, a quarter um, Korean. Right. So, and then my name, my mother named me Portia from Shakespeare, right. P O R T I A. So the kids, I went to McKinley School, they called me Portilla Tortilla because right. right. I was the Mexican kid, right? right? There were a couple other Mexican kids there, but. Right. Um, and they thought that was fun, so I <laughs> I was desperate. I hated being teased, and I so I would I kept changing my name. I right. changed my name every week, trying to find something that I could get them to call me. Right. Um. Anyway, I named myself Tony when I was ten after watching Escape to Witch Mountain. How about that? <laughs> and it stuck, and I've held on to it ever since. Unbelievable. Huh? But um. Anyway, growing up in Redlands wasn't um. It wasn't too bad because there were a lot of. I mean, they called they called us beaners, right? Mm -hmm. Where anybody who was who was a Latino heritage was a beaner. Right. But there were everybody was divided. There were the socials and the stoners and the and the beaners and. Right. Um, we didn't have a huge black community, but I remember the black kids in school being very popular. Right. I know that our student body president was a, was a black boy, and right. um, he was in band and. He right. was just tremendously popular. And, right. And, uh, right. Anyway, yeah, they start. They have st stopped segregating, and it's a right. beautiful thing. Right. Our history has gone unrecorded largely. There's one man um, who started recording it a couple of years ago. Right. I, I did a big story about that. He's he's he wrote a book and made a, a video. Right. And I had the honor of introducing the launch of that book on my birthday a few wow. years ago. So I was very proud. To do that. So there's so much of that history. To, how well of a job do you think Redlands does of getting that history out? Bad. It's bad. It's bad. I tried so hard. One of the things I learned as the editor, I was the first Latina editor or Latin Latino editor um, at the Redlands Daily Fact. Mm -hmm. And um, they right away told me, you know, don't don't bother with the north side of Redlands. They don't wow. subscribe. They're not interested, wow. right? And then they would, and I remember uh, Joe Gonzalez coming into my office and saying, what are you doing? To, how come you, we want it right off the bat. We want right. to be covered here. And I said, Joe, help me. This is my goal. Right. Yeah. I want to cover people of color. I want to cover people of all income right. uh, brackets. I want to get out there. Let's put photographs of uh, folklorico dancing and quinceañeras in there, and let's get right. the awards that they're getting at Clement and Lagonia School, and let's you know let's talk about the issues right. that are facing these people. And so I went out there because I said, "This is my hair." My grandmother grew up on the corner of Western and Webster, mm -hmm. and there are so many stories in my family, a yes. huge family, about what it was like in the neighborhood right, and they're sure. beautiful stories. They're so proud of their history in town right. and where the heck is it? Right. So, um, so I went out there and I tried meeting as many people as I could and getting as many pictures and I could not get hmm. people who were generally of lower income and generally of color to, to agree to have a relationship with the paper. They wouldn't wow. tell me what was going on. I would find out something and show up. They didn't want me there. Like right. it was, it was really surprising to me. And I'm not accusing anybody of anything. It's right. just this was my experience, and I, right. I have to wonder what happened. Yeah. That that there's no trust mm -hmm. and there's no investment right. in that relationship. Right, um, right. How can we? I shouldn't say no, but there wasn't much. But it's hard. It's a difficulty, right? 
how can we, from your view as uh, somebody that's been in Redlands all your life and somebody that cares about Redlands, um, how would you help people go about doing what they need to do? I think one of the things that's inspiring about your story is that you were you were civically engaged. You, you know what I mean? It was part of your job to be engaged, right? But then you twisted into actually being on the council and really doing some things that were really important. But what about the person, talk to the person that hasn't been a journalist for 30 years. They don't know the questions to ask, right? But what's happening in the community affects them just like it affects everybody else. How would somebody that wants to be involved or wants to, to know, to understand better, and this is an increased challenge, keeping it real with, you know, Redlands facts, not being the Redlands facts anymore either. Do you know what I mean? Not being local. Um, how do you encourage people that may not know where to start um, uh, to be engaged and to find out things about the community that they care about? Well, I, th I think that that's based on a false premise. I think this question um, forgets the fact that, that everybody has a community um, that they're engaged in that right. matters to them, right? right? Um, okay. When I talk about, like, my family probably felt, probably the people who were publicly, civically engaged when my family was growing up here, my mother was growing up here, or my grandparents, um, they would have felt like, gosh, you know, these people with parks and the Landeroses are not are not civically engaged. But they were they had a huge community right, sure. in their neighborhood. There yeah. were events and celebrations and traditions and and people who interacted with one another and they were very happy and they didn't see any reason to change. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I think that your point though is that policy right, sure. and infrastructure right. and the things that everybody shares, the economy and the police force and all of these things are being decided on and they're, right. di they're not plugged into it and they're not affecting the decisions that are getting made. Right. So, um, so in that regard, what would I suggest? It's very difficult to be as hands-on as people I think think that they aspire to be. Right. And I I had said I said a couple of times something that people people were kind of they would frown at me when I said it. And I said I I'm so jealous of people who just get to use our town. <laughs> um, because as the as the editor, I felt like I had to know everything yeah, all the time. For sure. You yeah. know, people hear a siren, they are see a helicopter or, or whatever's going on, they call me. What is yeah, this? What's constantly. this flyer I saw? And I had to be ahead of it. Right. And that's stressful. Yeah. And again, my problems are my own. I create my own problems, right? I probably should have just gotten comfortable saying, I don't know. If you find out, let me know. <laughs> As opposed to going and seeing it out. I'm busy. I put in my eight hours already like I could have. But, um, but I just felt like I needed to always know what everybody right. was doing and whatever, what was happening. And then, of course, on the council, I've, I've already told you in the last segment we recorded, I felt it was compulsory that I needed to learn every single thing that was happening and the history of it and the future of it and the context of it and the people and why, the motivations and the resources. And I thought I would look at people and I thought, you just get to get up in the morning and go about your business in this community, and if you're curious about something, you'll ask. Right. right. And you just get to use the services and the infrastructure and the personnel that we provide and choose what you want to do and be engaged in, and it's a beautiful thing, and I was jealous of it. I was also jealous of coming back to when something I had talked about, how you have to put, put yourself up for criticism. The... People at the grocery store, there's this really nice lady who works as a cashier at the grocery store that I see all the time, and everybody loves her. Right. They don't know. She gets to get up in the morning and just go be nice to everybody right, and have yeah, everybody sure. love her and go home at the end of her day yeah. and, and do whatever she makes her happy in her own space. Right. And I thought, my gosh, that would be heaven. Right. That would be heaven. Right. I would like to get up in the morning and be nice to everybody and have them like me, but instead they look at the issues and see what side they think I'm on or that I've said I was on right. and decide whether I'm the enemy, right? Yeah, and and yeah. 
And so you choose your you choose your problems. And I chose at some point not to keep having those problems. Right. How did I get on this tangent? I was talking That's about good, something though. entirely different. So well, here's what you got to do. This is what you got to give us. This is the last piece. I want people to understand um, what the future looks like for you and what people are going to be looking. Um, and seeing you do next, because I think that's what inquiring minds want to know. Oh, I, I'm always telling people choose joy, choose joy. Mm -hmm. And it's a like I have so many little cliches that I really think about what they mean, and I when I say them, I really mean it. And I have chosen joy. I've always wanted to write children's books. In right. fact, I should take that back. I've always written children's books. Right, yeah, I sure. wrote my first children's book when I was pregnant with my son, and he's 28. So right, it was wow. a it was a long time ago, and I put it in a drawer. Right. And then I wrote another one when my daughter was born. I put that on top of it in the drawer, and I started stacking them up. I have right. a lot of manuscripts, and I'm right. proud of them. I'm excited right. about them. Wow. So when um, my kids were in elementary school, they had an author come to the school with his books, and I said, how do you get pub? I have some books that I think are the greatest thing ever. How do I be like you? He said, you got to join the, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. You got to go through these critiques. It's, it's a big process. There's right. rules. You got to learn the rules. You got to go right. through the critiques. You got to find an agent. You got to know what that agent's already published, so you can say, "Here's why I chose you." And then right. you got to, you know, or you go to an editor, and there's this whole process. And I thought, well, I don't have time for that, but I somehow found time to keep writing manuscripts. So by the time I made this decision to leave the city council, I said, "I'm going to do all the things." I've been a member of the SCBWI since 2004. Right. Wow. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to wow. spend the time getting them critiqued and doing the revisions and finding an agent. And I'm yeah. so happy. Yeah. Cheers. Look for my children. Can you imagine s what it would be like to have something you made on the shelves at the Frugal Frigate They're and the Smiley <laughs> Library <laughs> to go to the schools that yeah. my children attended and read a book to the kids and an nuts, assembly. Yeah. I mean, I just... This is, this is so exciting, and right. I'm doing this now. Well, that's a wonderful full and circle just, moment thing. I'm you know? using Redland. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm a customer. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, it's good. I mean, well, you've certainly put your work in it, Redland, so you have a right to use it. So I appreciate this uh, session uh, sessions. Uh, I'm really excited about people being able to see a side of you that they haven't. I think it's always been there. And, and it's not a side that people are like, oh, my God, Tony, I, I was misplacing my, but it, it, ex, it, it explains you. It, 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 it combs you out. It shows people, oh, my God, this is why she's so heartfelt and why her heart goes into everything that she does. And, and yes, she does love this community so much so that she sacrificed a lot personally and otherwise. So I appreciate you taking time with us on the Joe Speak podcast. Thank, Thank you, my you. friend, sister. I appreciate you. Bam. <laughs>